Hi everyone, it's Lisa from I Dream in Soap. Welcome to my channel and thanks for dropping by. In this video we're going to be talking about the impact that the amount of water that you use has on your cold process soap. So we're going to start off looking at things like the various terms that you hear surrounding water discounts and things and also how some of the calculations are made. And then we're going to move on to look at some of the issues that arise like glycerin rivers and soda ash, those types of things. And with each one of those issues I'm actually going to be making some soap so you can see how the effects happen and perhaps what you can do to stop them rather than just reading about them or hearing them from somebody else. Now this is a reasonably long video and I fully appreciate that not everyone is going to want to watch every single part of it. So I have in the description below done some little timestamps that should take you to the various parts of the video that you may be interested in. Now this video is not intended to be a complete scientific paper on any of the issues that I'm discussing. And also, because of time constraints, I can obviously only go into these issues to a certain degree. So therefore, I've tried to focus the content on this video on giving information to us as soapers that you would find helpful when making your cold process soap, rather than trying to delve too much into the scientific explanations. But hey, if you find this stuff interesting, like I do, why not do a little bit more research yourself? There's so much information out there on the internet. So let's start off by considering the term water discount. Now, if we're ever going to do a discount, it's useful to know what the full amount is to start with. And that's a problem with cold processed soap, because there's no official full amount of water that we should be using. Now, different lye calculators or recipe books or whatever it is that you're using will use different amounts for their full water. So, if for example we had a look at soap calc, soap calc typically uses 38% of oil weight as their standard full water amount. Whereas if we took exactly that same recipe and popped it into Soap Maker Free, you would see that you would end up with your full water at nearly 42% of oil weight. So, different lie calculators and resources use different amounts as their standard amount of water, and that can lead to inconsistency. Because if we were going to do, let's say, a 10% discount on those recipes, we would end up with two different amounts that we want to reduce our water by, and also two different amounts of water that we'd end up with in our final recipe. So whilst water discounts themselves are not incorrect to use, it's better to use them if you stick with one lie calculator and maybe you don't swap and compare recipes with other people who use different things. Because as we've seen, if you try and make a swap and talk about discounts with other people, you are actually going to end up with different amounts of water in your recipe and therefore may not get the result that you're expecting. So let's start off by looking at some of the terminology and the most common terms you'll come across are water as a percent of oils, lye concentration or water to lye ratio. So for the first bit of this tutorial I'm just going to use a really basic recipe, well it's not even a recipe, it's just some coconut oil popped into soap calc to help explain where these calculations come from. So I've just popped a thousand grams of oil, coconut oil, into soap calc. Now whether you work in ounces or grams, it doesn't matter. These calculations will all work and will all be the same. So we're just going to work off of this basic recipe while I explain the calculations. Now if you fully understand what these terms mean, then great, just skip forward and go on to the next part of the video. So we're just going to pick up these very straightforward ingredients that we have here. 
our water, lye and oils and we're just going to discuss how we get to these figures at the top of our soap calc page or wherever you have them in your lye calculator. So let's do our water as a percentage of oils first. For this calculation, we simply take the amount of oils, in our recipe it was 1000 grams, and the amount of water, again in our recipe it was 380 grams. And all we do to get this figure is we literally just compare them to each other. So we can see that 380 is 38% of the oils that we've got. So that's how we get to our first measurement. For the next two calculations, we're going to ignore the amount of oils and just think about our lye solution. So let's deal with that lye concentration figure first. So if we take our lye at 174 grams and add our 380 grams of water, we'll end up with a total lye solution that weighs 554 grams. And what we want to do is we want to look at the amount of lye in that entire solution. So we're just going to work out a percentage. So the 174 grams divided by the 554 grams times 100, that will give us a percent of 31.41%. So our lye solution is just over 31% of lye. So we can check that back to soap calc. Now this last calculation is just another way of looking at what we've just done because both of these two calculations are simply looking at how strong our lye solution is. So for our water lye ratio we are just going to again consider the same little recipe that we've got but this time we're just going to look at the amount of lye, our 174 grams, and compare it to the amount of water. And from that, we're going to work out a ratio. So if we take our 380 grams of water, divide it by our 174 grams of lye, we can see that we've got 2.18 times more water than we have lye. So let's just check that back to our soap calc figures, and there's our calculations done. So hopefully you can see now how we get to each of those figures and maybe they make a little bit more sense. Really the main thing to take from this is that the bottom two calculations are just different versions of the same calculation. They're both trying to measure how strong your lye solution is. The first calculation doesn't directly consider that although it does get there in a roundabout sort of way because obviously the more water you put in as a percentage of oils the weaker your lye solution is going to get the less water per percentage of oils the stronger your lye solution is going to get okay so which one should you use now quite often I see quite a bit of debate and almost some heated discussion about which calculation is best to use I strongly believe that you should just use the calculation that you understand the most. Which one is the easiest for you to comprehend? I'll just explain some of the rationale behind why some people don't like the first calculation, but then I'll also explain why I don't get too hung up about it. Now, I think the reason why people alter their water percentage quite a lot of the time is to help to control trace in their batter and to stop their batter accelerating. Now the acceleration will typically be caused by having a stronger lye solution and the more lye you've got and the stronger lye solution you've got it's felt that your batter accelerates quicker. Now using water as a percentage of oils doesn't directly consider the strength of your lye solution. The reason for that is because different oils have different saponification values. They need more or less lye to turn them into soap. Let's compare two oils. So if we go back to our good old simple coconut oil recipe at that 38% of water to oil weight, can you see that we've got those figures that we calculated previously? 
we know that that gave us a lye concentration of 31.418% or a water to lye ratio of 2.1829. Let's do exactly the same thing now, so 38% as a percentage of oils, but comparing that with palm oil this time. Now let's have a look at these percentages. Our lye concentration is 26.184% and our water to lye ratio is 2.8191. Let's bring back our coconut oil recipe and remember for both recipes we used water at 38% of oil so they both had exactly the same amount of water in them. But look at the different strengths of those lye solutions. The coconut oil lye solution is quite a bit stronger than the palm oil lye solution. And the reason for that is the saponification value of the oils. Let's just move this around so we can actually see how much lye we needed for our palm oil. And look, can you see that's quite a difference that we've actually got there, 40 grams between the two. So maybe you can perhaps understand why some people don't like using the water as a percentage of oils basis because it kind of doesn't really take into consideration how strong your lye solution is actually going to be. And if you like the idea of working with a more technically correct formula, then that's probably the camp for you. Now I'm actually a strong believer in you just picking the method that you understand the most and that will work the best for you. I'm not trying to dispute at all that the second two methods are more scientifically correct and accurate. They are. But I do also believe that if you're someone that uses a very similar recipe most of the time, then any of these methods will work for you. If you want to use a percentage of oils as your water weight, if you just increase that percentage, you'll get a weaker lye solution. If you reduce the percentage, you'll get a stronger lye solution and overall you will get the same effect. And if you're massively changing a recipe, then as we've already discussed, the lye solution is only going to be one of the things that affects how your batter reacts. So yeah, Pick the one that you find the easiest to work for, but hopefully now we've gone through all the calculations and the reasons for them, when you see people talking about the different types of calculations and percentages and ratios, you'll hopefully understand what it is that they're talking about. Okay, goodness me, must be time to make some soap, mustn't it? So I'm now going to show you some examples of what can happen when you do have less water in your soap. Typically, less water can give you less soda ash, also reduce the chance of glycerin rivers. It can definitely help you unmold your soap a little bit easier. And to a certain extent, it can help with the cure time. I'm just going to cover that one really quickly. It will allow your bar of soap to become harder quicker and get to that point where you get a nice long-lasting bar of soap sooner. However, curing is not just about water loss, there are chemical changes that go on as well. Now I'm not doing this video to cover in depth the amount of cure time, so I just wanted to just raise it as a fact that your soap bar will be harder sooner, but it won't necessarily be the best soap that it can be until those chemical changes have taken place. And then dealing with the disadvantages that can arise, typically these revolve around the speed that your batter moves. So we're going to consider the effect that less water has on getting to trace and then the acceleration effect that you could have once you add in maybe your fragrance oil. And notice there I've put a question mark next to trace because I think you may find um, a little bit surprising what we discuss. And then lastly, I've popped gel phase in the middle of advantages and disadvantages just because it depends whether you like soaps that go through gel or you prefer them not to. 
Generally, the rule is that the more water that you have in your soap recipe, the easier that it is for that soap to go through gel. And what we're going to have a look at is the impact that gel can have on different colours and things that you put in your soaps, so therefore you can gauge that gel phase effect. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at the effect of more or less water on the speed that your soap batter comes to trace. So what I've got here is I've got one single batch of oils, so my oils are identical for how I mix them up, and I've got two little pots of lye solution. Now both of these have been sitting for a while in a little bath of water, so again my lye solution is in exactly the same temperature, my oils are both from the same batch and are obviously exactly the same temperature. The only difference between the two batches that I'm making up here will be the amount of water in the lye solutions. So I'm just going to weigh my oils and split them exactly in half. And then add in those two differing lye solutions. And I'm not sure how well you can see it, but on one of my little pots, I've written H in red. So I'm just marking the one pot that's going to have the high water content. I haven't bothered putting an L or anything on the other pot. So once my lye solution is added, I'm just going to give it a nice stir. Now one thing I'm just going to ask you to bear with me is these are not completely accurate scientific experiments. I'm just here making some soap to demonstrate the effects to us as soap makers. I'm not in a lab or anything, but I'm doing the best I can to keep things as consistent as possible. I'm going to try and make sure that I mix each piece of batter as accurately as I can so they both get mixed by the same amount. So I'm going to use a stopwatch on my phone so I mix for the same duration of time. And also I'm going to be using my mini mixer because I've only got a small bit of soap here. And also my mini mixer only actually has one speed on it so therefore the power going into each one of these should be the same. So I'm going to give each portion of soap batter exactly the same amount of mixing and then stop and check to see if I've got to an emulsion. So the first couple of times I checked, not surprisingly, I didn't have emulsion in either of the batters, so I just kept on repeating the process. And then after my third set of blending, I tested it again. And you can see I'm testing here the high water soap first of all. And I have now got to an emulsion. And then testing the low water soap at exactly the same point after exactly the same amount of blending and everything, I've got an emulsion as well. Now I think this is something that a lot of people will find surprising and I've often actually found this when mucking around with different amounts of water that the amount of water doesn't tend to actually affect how quickly your batter comes to trace. People do tend to expect that if you've got less water, your batter will trace quicker than if you've got more water. Now, really the reasoning behind this is that yes, technically you would expect the lower water batter to perhaps trace quicker because it's got a more concentrated lye solution. However, 
when you've got the higher amount of water you've got a more fluid batter and therefore all of the various different elements the lye the water all the basic molecules and bits are able to move around much more quickly and interact with each other a lot more quickly think about if you mixed any fluids if you try and mix a thick heavy fluid it's much harder to mix that and get it all dispersed than if you try and mix a nice light fluid so really that's the theory here of what's going on is that when you've got different amounts of water getting your batter to trace is probably not going to be particularly different between either of them So now we're going to carry on using those two batters and obviously just keeping a check on which is high and which is low. And the first thing I'm now going to do is try and have a look at the effect of water on how much soda ash is produced on some soap. I'm going to do two things with this batter. So therefore, I'm just going to split off a bit of my high water batter and a bit of my low water batter into separate little pots. And for each of them, again, I'm trying to be as accurate as possible, splitting off exactly the same amounts. And then I'm going to add exactly the same amount of my dispersed colorant into each of the pots so we keep everything nice and consistent. Then I'll just make sure that colorant is nicely dispersed and I'm just going to pour them into some individual cavity molds. And as you can see, I'm just keeping a track with that little H on the top of one of the rows of my cavity moulds so I can always just make sure I know which one's which. Then because I'm testing for soda ash, I'm not going to do anything that would normally stop my soda ash happening. So things that people normally do, things like spraying with rubbing alcohol or maybe covering the soap, those sort of things. I'm literally just going to take these moulds, put them to the side and just leave them on the side and let them sit there and see what naturally happens. So let's jump forward to the next day and unmold those soaps. So first of all, as you can see on the left hand side is my soap that had my low water content. And as you can see from this, there's very little soda ash on it at all. A minute, tiny bit right on the top, but overall it's just that sort of pretty grey colour all the way over. Let's now pop out that high water content bar and can you instantly see that white film of soda ash all over it? And remember, considering these bars were treated in an identical way, just apart from the different water content, there's actually quite a dramatic difference in the level of soda ash on those two bars. So why do we get more soda ash on that high water soap? Well, it's all to do with the unsaponified lye that's in your soap rising to the surface and reacting with the carbon dioxide in the air. And that turns into sodium carbonate, which is soda ash. And with a higher liquid soap, there's much more opportunity for those molecules to move around as that soap takes longer to set up and therefore more of it will get exposed to the air and leave you with more soda ash. Now again, there are other things that cause soda ash, like how thin your trace is when you pour, but in this video I'm just trying to concentrate on the effect that water has in your soap rather than make a video specifically on soda ash. So I'm now going to use those other bits of batter that I've got. Now they haven't been sitting for very long at all. They're still both very, very fluid and just under a light trace. Now we've already seen that getting to trace doesn't seem to really be affected by the amount of water that you have in your soap mix. However, let's have a look at the effect of an accelerating fragrance. 
Now this fragrance that I'm using doesn't accelerate really badly and suddenly turn into soap on a stick, but it does tend to hurry the batter along at quite a reasonable rate. So once again, I'm just dealing with an identical amount of soap batter that I've got. The only difference between the two is that one has more water than the other. They're both at the same temperature and as you saw, we mix them up both at the same time and all of those sort of things. So I'm now adding an identical amount of the same fragrance oil to each of those batters. I'm going to mix the fragrance oils in an even amount in both sides and then with my timer set I'm just going to leave them and come back and mix them both again exactly the same amounts every few minutes or so so we can see the effect. So after that first mixing, as you can see, they're both in a very, very similar type of state. So I'm just going to jump forward in chunks and just show you the effect, how these progress. At just over the 3 minute 20 second mark, you can see that that low water, the pink one, is starting to thicken up a bit and have a little bit more of a trace, whereas the high water is still saying really quite fluid. So at this point, I'm just going to transfer them into the cavity moulds just so that you can see them nice and clearly because it's a little tricky seeing those white pots. And maybe you can see here that as I've poured them into the moulds, the low water one, the one at the top of the picture, has actually formed a little bit of a blob because it's thicker, whereas the high water one, the one in the row with the H at the top, has actually flowed nicely into the mould. At just under the 10 minute mark, you can see that my low water has actually got to what I would consider a pretty thick trace at this point. Whereas when we look at our high water, that's still pretty fluid. At just over the 17 minute mark, you can see that my low water batter is now pretty thick and it's not even coming off the spoon, whereas that high water is still perfectly pourable. So I think we've done enough with that low water soap, I'm going to leave that one alone and we'll just keep an eye on the high water one and see when it catches up. So at just under the 40 minute mark, we can see that that high water batter still is a little bit ploppy. It's not as thick as the low water batter was, but I think we've kind of proved the point that more water in your soap batter, whilst it may not change how quickly your soap actually comes to trace when you blend it in, certainly when you're dealing with something like an accelerating fragrance oil, it will make a considerable difference in how much time you get to muck around with your soap and perhaps do your soap designs. Now let's have a look at glycerin rivers. A lot of people seem to think that titanium dioxide causes glycerin rivers. This actually isn't the case. So what I'm doing here in this little test is first of all I'm taking my oils and I'm mixing titanium dioxide straight into the oils so that both of my soaps are going to have exactly the same quantity of titanium dioxide in them. Once again, I've made up two lye solutions, one with a high water amount and one with a low water amount. And normal things, I've kept them at exactly the same temperature and tried to keep things as consistent as possible. I'm going to divide out my oils exactly evenly and then add my lye solutions and bring them to the same sort of trace. Thank you. 
And then to try and keep as many other factors as consistent as possible, I'm going to pour them both into exactly the same mould with just a little cardboard divider down the middle so that they both go into the same temperature mould, they both get the same amount of insulation, they're both going to be treated in exactly the same way. The only difference between the two is the amount of water. So I then covered the soap and popped it in the oven and see popped as normal. I did make sure that I forced gel because you do need gel for glycerin rivers to be created. If your soap doesn't gel then you won't get glycerin rivers. I then unmoulded the soap and let's cut it the next day. So the first bar coming out from the low water side. So a nice clear bar of soap, no glycerin revers. Let's turn that loaf round and chop one from the high water side next. And there we go, look at that. You can clearly see that there's a significant number of glycerin rivers in this section of the soap. As the soap goes through gel phase, everything is a little bit more fluid within the soap structure. And then as that soap starts to cool down, Different acids, the different fats in your soap, will start to solidify at different rates. So some fats will start to solidify sooner than others. Now what happens with your pigments, so typically like your titanium dioxide, is that they will actually move away from the solidifying soap and they'll then bunch up, as it were, in the soap that's still in that sort of gel phase. And that's why when your soap has completely set up, it will look like you've got some areas without colour and some areas with a heavy presence of colour. And that effectively is exactly what's happened. But it's not the titanium dioxide causing the rivers, it's just because of its pigment size, it emphasises the effect of them more. So how does having a high water content then create these glycerin rivers? Well, glycerin rivers occur most prominently when you've actually got a longer and extended gel phase and the soap has a period of time where it cools down in a more gradual way. So the longer that that period happens over, the more chance that you've got for these glycerin rivers to develop. Soap with a low water content quite often may not even go through gel phase or if it does, if maybe you force gel, that gel happens at a higher level and it's much more of a peak. The temperature goes up, the gel phase happens, it's over very quickly and then it cools down more quickly. And therefore these glycerin rivers don't really get the time to form properly. So as we can see, that combination of a higher water and more heat, so going through gel phase, is what's going to cause you to have your glycerin rivers. You can certainly still put your soap through gel phase, and I always do. If you have a lower amount of water, then you shouldn't get your glycerin rivers. So in our last little example, I'm just going to talk about gel phase. Now I'm not going to muck around with different quantities of water here. We know now, don't we, that the more water you have in your soap, the more likely that it is to go through gel. What I want to do here is just show you the effect that going through gel can have on the colours in your soap. 
So I've specifically chosen these colours that I'm going to use. Um, firstly, because we know most people feel, and it's generally the case, that colours seem to be brighter when they go through gel phase. Some colours do actually almost need a gel phase to activate them properly, and activated charcoal is a classic example there to get a nice strong black. However, some colours, like for example yellows, do tend to almost weaken through gel phase, and you tend to get a stronger colour without gel than you do with gel. So, as I've already said, I am not changing the amount of water within these colours because I want to keep everything consistent and just literally show you the difference between gel and no gel. I'm going to make up an entire batch of soap and then I'm going to divide it into the four colours. And then for each of those four colours, I'm going to split them out and half of the colours I'm going to pop into my little cavity mould and then the other half of the colours I'm just going to put into sort of a pipe and the ones in the pipe I'm going to put through gel and the ones in the cavity moulds I'm going to make sure that they don't go through gel. I am going to use an accelerating fragrant soil so that I can get the layers set up in my pipe so I've just chosen this one because it just doesn't discolour at all and you can see how lovely and white it is. And in an effort to try and not make this video too ridiculously long, I've just jumped to the end where you can see I've got all of my four colours made up. And I'm going to seep pop my pipe and then my cavity moles. I'm actually just going to cover those and pop them in the fridge to make sure they don't go through gel. So here are the soaps the next day. And if we just have a look at the unmoulded, ungelled soaps. And then we cut up our little pipe of gelled soaps. We can now compare them together. So remember the square are the ungelled, the round are the gelled. So as you can see that green is so much brighter in its gelled form than it is in its ungelled form. And as we expected that yellow is actually duller in its gelled form. Remember yellows, a lot of pastel colours seem stronger if you don't gel them because the gelling process makes them more translucent. Our black, again, as we expected, gel phased forced that to be a nice strong black, whereas ungelled we got a greyy colour. And then finally my red, not a massive amount of difference here with that one. So as you can see, not every single colour is going to have a massive difference when it goes through gel or not gel phase. So again, hopefully you can see from that that there is a difference about whether your soap does gel or not. What effect do you want to have on your colours? Well, that's up to you and therefore from that you should choose whether you want to gel or not gel your soap. I hope you've enjoyed this video and you found it useful. If you have, it would be great if you left me a thumbs up. If you'd like to see what I'm making in the future, why not subscribe to my channel? And if you've got any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching everyone. Happy soaping!